Obesity is defined as having an excess of body fat, and we focus on having too much body fat because that is harmful. Body fatness can be measured directly or can be estimated. Body fat is estimated by the body mass index BMI measure. This is body weight in pounds or kilograms divided by height in inches or centimeters. The height value in the denominator is squared, so that tallness has a lowering effect on the measure. There are some websites that will calculate the BMI measure, so it doesn't have to be done manually. Data has shown that the larger the BMI, the more risk for obesity-related diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and heart disease. The BMI calculation uses just body weight and height to estimate body fatness. It is therefore not a direct measure of body fat. For this reason, BMI can be inaccurate if the body weight of the individual is really high due to muscle. For example, many athletes have excess weight because they have a lot of body muscle rather than having a lot of body fat. The BMI measure classifies that such individuals are obese, but this is inaccurate. Also, comparisons between women and men at the same BMI would indicate that they have similar body fat, but actually women tend to carry more body fat than men. Again, older and younger people can be shown to have the same BMI, but usually the older person has more body fat. This indicates that using BMI may not be sufficient when estimating a person's body fat and therefore their risk for developing obesity-related disease. The most accurate measurement for measuring body fat, or the gold standard measure, is called air displacement plethysmography. It measures body fat using body volume and body weight to calculate body density. Since fat is less dense than other body tissues, like muscle and bone, knowing a person's body density can be used to measure body fatness. The air displacement method replaces underwater weighing, which works the same way, but is much more challenging to measure. Obesity is defined as having a body fat level greater than 25% if you're a man, and greater than 35% if you're a woman. Other instruments can measure the total fat in the body, including bioelectrical impedance, magnetic resonance imaging, or dual X-ray absorptiometry. Unfortunately, many of the instruments used to measure body fat directly are very expensive and are only used in the research setting. Another way to assess obesity is to measure body fatness in particular regions in the body. Measuring fat in the abdominal region is particularly informative because having too much fat in the abdomen is detrimental. To do this, we can measure waist circumference or the height of the abdominal area. These two measures are cheap and easy to do in the clinic or other settings and can provide important information about a person's risk of disease from obesity. So we just talked about how we can estimate obesity, but how does obesity actually occur? Data shows that obesity is a result of an imbalance of energy intake and energy expenditure. When we ingest foods and drink, we take in energy in the form of calories, in proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. We need that energy for our organs to function, and this is called basal metabolism. We also need energy to digest our food, and this is called dietary thermogenesis. We also need energy when, we are, when our muscles are active, such as standing, walking, or exercise. If we take in too much energy and don't use it for these functions, the excess energy is stored as fat. This was advantageous when we had a scarcity of food. Fat stores could be relied upon for energy during times of starvation. However, currently, cheap and excess food is readily available and people get very little exercise, especially in developed countries around the world. And the result of this is obesity. There are debates about whether energy imbalance is the only route to obesity. Some researchers have hypothesized that obesity is due to viral infections, environmental pollutants, sugar consumption, better control of the temperature of our environment, and other factors, but evidence for these hypotheses is not yet convincing. There are many diseases that have been shown to be a consequence of obesity. The relationship between obesity and type 2 diabetes is the most studied and understood. However, obesity can negatively impact most of the physiological systems in the body, including the cardiovascular, causing heart disease and stroke, 
the endocrine causing diabetes, the reproductive system causing menstrual disorders and infertility, the musculoskeletal system causing osteoarthritis and gout, the respiratory system causing sleep apnea and asthma, and the gastrointestinal system causing fatty liver and reflux disease. Obesity has also been associated with various cancers, including breast, liver, pancreas, and colorectal. Psychological health can be also impacted by obesity, including depression, negative self-esteem, and social stigmatization. Society has negative attitudes about people who are obese that can affect their ability to obtain employment, education, and health care. There are debates about whether obesity is bad for our health, as some of the data suggests. However, when we look at changes in health in people who were obese and have experienced weight loss, we find strong evidence for the causal link between obesity and disease. Weight loss causes a decrease in risk of many diseases, including diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and even depression, as well as improves quality of life. This supports the claim that obesity is bad for health. The reason that excess body fat leads to the disease is under investigation. One major finding realized about 20 years ago is that adipose tissue produces a number of hormones and other molecules that are involved in the immune system called cytokines. This slide shows many of the molecules made by adipose tissue. When adipose tissue is in excess, the levels of harmful hormones and cytokines are increased, and the levels of beneficial hormones are decreased. The normal function of cytokines is to attack foreign invaders in the body, but when they're elevated in the obese state, they attack the body itself. Higher than normal levels of cytokines, such as leptin, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and lower than normal levels of factors such as adiponectin, can influence processes such as oxidative stress, inflammation, and cell growth in ways that can be detrimental. This slide shows visually the impact of adipose tissue in the abdominal area. Excess adipose tissue accumulated in the intra-abdominal area, especially around the liver, the stomach, and the pancreas, is more prone to producing harmful cytokines compared to adipose tissue that's located in the hips and thighs. This is why having an apple shape due to central adiposity is more risky for heart disease, diabetes, and cancer compared to having a pear shape. For women, their risk increases if waist circumference is greater than 88 centimeters or 35 inches. For men, the risk increases if waist circumference is greater than 102 centimeters or 40 inches, according to guidelines from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Because of all the data showing the harmful effects of excess adipose tissue, obesity was finally classified as a disease in June 2013. This enables doctors to provide obesity treatment to patients and specifies that treatment for this disease should be covered under insurance. So, now that we know we should be treating obesity, what are the approaches that can be used to treat obesity? So managing obesity by weight loss is a good way to reduce the risk of obesity-related disease. The three approaches used to treat obesity are lifestyle modification, pharmacology, and bariatric surgery, and the recommendations for each depend on the severity of obesity. The guidelines for selecting each treatment approach were updated in 2013 by experts in the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and the Obesity Society for the U.S. population. For all categories of weight, overweight and obesity, lifestyle or behavior modification strategies are recommended. Lifestyle modification includes changing an individual's dietary or activity behavior to reduce calories and increase exercise. A variety of dietary and physical activity approaches have been shown to be effective in producing about a 5% reduction in body weight in overweight and obese individuals. Although a 5% reduction in body weight can be as small as only 10 pounds in some individuals, there are health benefits associated with that, including a lower blood sugar level and a lower blood pressure level. Examples of dietary approaches to induce weight loss are the low-fat diet, 
the low-carbohydrate diet, or the Mediterranean diet. A research study that was recently done by Shai and others compared the benefits of these three different dietary approaches. Their findings showed that all three diets were effective in the short term. This is good because years of study have shown that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work, and we may need to tailor strategies to individual patients for better weight loss results. As the slide shows, after about six months on the diets, the participants gained some of their weight back. This is a common finding, as maintenance of weight loss is a problem for many people, and they regain the lost weight over the long term. The study by Shai and others showed the benefits of weight loss in people who used either a low-fat diet, a Mediterranean-style diet, or a low-carbohydrate diet. In the left panel, you can see the rise in HDL cholesterol, which is good because that's the good cholesterol. In the right panel, you can see the drop in triglycerides, and both of these changes are beneficial for lowering heart disease. Pharmacology is the second approach that we can use to treat individuals for obesity. Remember that pharmacology can be used in individuals who are overweight and have health complications such as diabetes or high blood pressure, or individuals who are obese. Although there's a tremendous number of drugs that claim to treat obesity, and this is a billion dollar industry, there are few drugs that have actually been proven to be effective and that are also approved by the Food and Drug Administration. The one that has been around the longest is Orlistat, and it can be found without prescription under the name Ally. This drug works as an inhibitor of fat digestion by inhibiting the lipase enzyme. It works to decrease absorption of fat in the diet. It also induces about a 5% weight loss. The main complaint with taking Ally is diarrhea, which some people do not like, and then they stop using the drug. It is also recommended that users take a vitamin supplement to reduce the risk of deficiency, especially since they do not absorb fat-soluble vitamins very well. There have also been prescription drugs that were approved by the FDA for obesity during the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s, but each of these were taken off the market due to side effects such as heart disease and high blood pressure. Between 2010 and 2012, there were no FDA-approved medications for obesity. Then in June 2012, two drugs were approved, one called Quismia and the other one called Belvic. These drugs do have some side effects, including heart problems and hypertension, and approval by the FDA was initially denied. However, the FDA subsequently approved them with warnings, and users of the drugs are supposed to be very closely monitored. Since these drugs are new, we will have to wait for a few years to see their benefits as well as their side effects. The last type of treatment for obesity is bariatric surgery. This is recommended for individuals who have a BMI greater than 35 kilograms per meter squared and have obesity-related health problems such as diabetes or hypertension, or it's also recommended for individuals who have a BMI greater than 40 kilograms per meter squared. There are three popular types of bariatric surgery in the U.S. The adjustable gastric banding and the sleeve gastrectomy procedures make the stomach smaller so individuals feel full after eating a small amount of food. The Roux and Y gastric bypass procedure makes the stomach smaller as well, but then it reroutes food to the latter part of the small intestine so that not all the calories that are eaten are absorbed. People who have bariatric surgery learn to avoid eating too much food and foods high in fat and sugar because they experience gastrointestinal discomfort such as pain, nausea, and diarrhea. Weight loss following bariatric surgery averages about 25% and 50 to 70% of individuals actually maintain this weight loss. Because of the large amount of weight loss, change in diet and change in gut hormones, diabetes, and other obesity-related diseases are eliminated or reduced in severity following surgery. However, side effects including deficiency in iron, vitamin D, calcium, and other essential nutrients can occur following surgery and can also have severe consequences if not diagnosed and treated. A study by Shower and others recently compared two bariatric surgeries to medical therapy alone 
using the most definitive study design, a randomized control trial. This showed that participants who had bariatric surgery had more dramatic weight loss and remission of diabetes and other health complications compared to those who had medical therapy alone. Again, for severely obese people who have the highest risk of obesity-related disease, bariatric surgery can be an effective treatment. For such an intensive and costly treatment, though, it is important to ensure the people who have surgery get the benefits and not the complications. So for take-home messages, it's important to remember that obesity is classified as a disease. But we are very hopeful for the future. We know better now how to prevent obesity and how to treat obesity, especially using individualized approaches.